Uh, but yeah, so basically, threats, uh, the number of threats is roughly trebling uh, every five years. So, you know, shortly, you know, according to the trend, you know, we can very, very quickly overrun by, um, by these attacks, by these breaches, by these compromises, by these loss of data. So, uh, we need to kind of try and apply uh, an element of black box thinking. So, uh, if, you, if you compare uh, the, the aviation industry, so whenever there's, a, a, you know, an accident of any, any shape or form, it's investigated into the minute detail, and then uh, the, you know, changes, whether it's in procedure, in terms of technology, in terms of you know, um, applying a fix somewhere, they are then quickly rolled out and then applied globally. Okay? Otherwise, you can't fly in certain countries. If you compare that to pretty much a lot of other industries, that sort of approach does not happen. And certainly in the, the cybersecurity arena and data protection industry, you know, if, if things are trebling every five years, then you know, we're not applying, we're not, we're not looking at the problem and trying to work out a different way of doing it, or even just trying to apply some metrics or some processes to actually try and help you know, stop these attacks. And one of the reasons is, is a lot of people don't think they've got data, they don't think they're a target, they don't think they're going to be compromised, they don't think they're in the line of sight of an attacker. Um, and that's because probably, you know, the, they, they think they don't have you know, credit card details or they don't have you know, payment information, then you know, they don't need to worry about it. But uh, in my, my current role, I specialize work in manufacturing and retail organizations. So on the, on the retail side of things, you know, absolutely those are the guys that are holding you know, PCI-esque data. But if you look at the, uh, the manufacturing, it's probably it's the second most attacked uh, vertical. Um, and they've got a lot more to, um, uh, to lose, you know, in terms of stuff they can't get back. You know, if you lose someone's credit card, you know, it's, an, it's a shame, it's not great, but you can change the card, you can change the details, and then it becomes invalid. You can't get back intellectual property that you've lost, okay? So everyone has, you know, something to lose uh, for various different, uh, you know, either data loss or, you know, target attack, denial of service. You know, everyone is vulnerable uh, and has something to lose in these scenarios. And so there's no real end in sight. So it's kind of a perfect storm of uh, motivated threat actors. So whether that's from, you know, all the way from the, the, the nation state S type people where, you know, they're writing very, very customized pieces of uh, software to disrupt, you know, whether it's a nuclear industry or, you know, in any kind of industry that a nation wants to attack, they've got huge amounts of wealth, manpower that they can throw at this, this problem. But on the other hand, uh, you know, there is a cyber, uh, cyber crime supply chain. You know, pe people can easily make a living off of selling software, selling services, or even compromising data and selling that on the black market. Uh, if you look at the dark web, uh, quote unquote, you'll find many, many forums where you can buy you know, credit cards. And when you have these massive breaches, like a few years ago in, in, uh, in the US when uh, Target got breached, they, re they retrieved all those, um, all those credit cards, it actually devalues it. So there is like kind of a, um, like, like on a stock exchange, like peaks and troughs. So as there's an influx of, of new data, then the value of those records actually goes down. But, you know, there's, there's other parts of this crime. You, you can rent out a botnet to take down your, your, uh, your competitor. You can buy ransomware. You can buy, you know, pretty much anything you want to um, on, on, this, on this black market. And, and there's an expanding attack service. So as again, as the, the gentleman beforehand explained, you know, we have Internet of Things is just the start of, the, uh, start of this. You know, when we start going to an you know, incredibly more digital lifestyle, that attack service is just expanding. You know, there's a lot of digital transformation projects that I, I work alongside customers with where they're moving into, you know, out of a paper-based system into, into a digital uh, uh, element, and it just makes things more complicated. And, you know, and these are not easy things to secure. You know, they, they want these systems to be open, to be accessible, to be easy to use, but obviously that then expands that attack surface. So you know, the, the, it's a very, very difficult problem to solve, as we know that, because you know, the, the, the actual number of volumes of attacks is, is going up. So we see a uh, strategic shift in where organizations are looking to focus their attention with, and from a, from a budget perspective. So if you look back to 2013, the vast majority of it was focused on trying to prevent these attacks from happening, trying to prevent people getting in the, in the door in the first place. Look at uh, two years later, you see the slice of the pie moving to uh, more than a detection and response, it, it grows. And then, and this is uh, a study by, by Gartner in 2016, uh, that more than 60% of enterprise budget will then be focused on detection and response um, by, by 2020. 
Uh, and the reason behind it is it's that attack surface is so large and it's incredibly difficult to secure every door, every window, every entry point to that, into that environment. You know, people use the same credentials on multiple sites. There's no way you can stop people doing that. So if I use the same password on two different webs uh, like, uh, at work and on a number of other websites and one of those becomes compromised, you know, there's no will in the world that I can prevent that, that, you know, someone logging in with that account. Okay, so that's why people are moving and thinking. Okay, well, we still need to do the prevention side of things. That's our, our, you know, our cyber hygiene, our cyber due diligence. But we need to move into, you know, what happens if someone gets in? What happens if they do get my my yeah, user's credentials? So that's where moving into a more into a detection and response uh, capability is where you know a lot of organisations are realising that they can't secure everything uh, and be a hundred percent preventative. So I'm sure many of you have seen this sort of uh, slide or diagram before where we talk about um, uh, the, the attack life cycle. So going from recon and planning all the way through to initial compromise, command and control, lateral movement, target attainment, uh, to exfiltration, corruption, disruption. So the earlier that you can detect and respond to uh, an adversary in, in this attack life cycle, then clearly the, 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 the less impact and the less data that you're going to uh, um, lose in that actual attack is, is going to be you know, is a lot less. If you can stop someone at the initial compromise phase, then that's great. But if they do manage to get past that detection and uh, preventative distraction, looking for those command and control, looking for that uh, lateral movement, looking for someone acting oddly compared to what they normally uh, how they normally work. Okay, so looking at these big data sets and trying to pu pull out the anomalous um, uh, figures and actually acting on it. So, so the, the solution to do this is to drive down these two metrics, mean time to detect and mean time to respond. Okay? So there's a study done uh, a few years ago where the, the average time to detect is measured in months and years. Okay? It, you know, many, many large um, uh, you know, breaches, you know, the, the adversary was in there for, for, for years. They're taking terabytes of data. You know, if you look at um, you know, some, some of the uh, corporate espionage sort of stories that are going on, at the moment, most customers are working in the years to months. Okay? But we need to drive down how long it takes people to detect it, which is you know, what, we're, you know, what, the, what you'd initially think is the, uh, the, the metric to look for, but increasingly the time to respond. So, okay, you know someone's doing something they shouldn't be doing. You know someone's got a foothold in your, in your environment. But if you have no way of you know, responding to it, if you're running around with your hair on fire because you have no clue what to do, then you, know, you're just, you may as well be blind. So this is kind of the, the holy grail, to move you into, uh, you know, into the minutes, which is easy to say you know, um, on, on paper, but you know, conceptually it's easy. In practice, again, it's hard to do. Uh, and the reasons behind it, um, there's a few different ones. So the first one is data quality. Okay. So when we're talking about big data, you know, huge volumes of it in different formats. Does anyone know who this thing is? I've not done a talk with no anyone does yet, so. Uh, so this is the, 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 the Babelfish from uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So the premise behind this was you could put this little, uh, little creature in your ear and he's able to translate all the different languages in the cosmos into something that you can understand. So, so what we're trying to do at Logarithm is act like that, that, that Babel fish, act like Google Translate, but for machine data. Okay? So if I see you know, event 4624 of log on type 10, um, or if I see you know, the, you know, someone logging in as root, or from a, a myriad of other devices, what you need to be able to do is quickly and effectively is translate that into something that you can understand, act on, and work with. So data quality is, is you know, a huge, especially as the data that's growing is, is big data, uh, big data world, being able to sort, cleanse, and normalize your data very, very quickly and effectively is the number one key aspect. So at Logarithm, we have a number of data scientists. Um, I was speaking to one uh, um, earlier in the year, uh, and previous to uh, working for us in the cybersecurity world, uh, he worked uh, at the local university, which is you know, uh, uh, Boulder, very, very big on, uh, and he was working on the polar ice caps. So he's taking in data from, you know, uh, ice samples, from wind strength to you know, sun quality, UV. So you think about all these data sensors that are coming in, and he somehow, he somehow had to normalize that into something that he can work with. 90% of his time was working on data normalization, data cleanliness, in order to make sense of it. Okay. So that's what we try to do as our number one priority uh, within Logarithm. 
So other obstacles in the uh, to uh, faster detection response is uh, alarm fatigue and swivel chair analysis. So the, the typical analyst or uh, you know IT person is bombarded with alarms. They they, they have multiple products to look at or uh, multiple screens, and they, they just don't have the time to do it. Okay. So this approach is not effective. So okay, yeah, we'll we'll invest in another tool. We'll put something else in the environment, which is you know is great. But what you know, someone's still got to look at it. Someone's still got to action it, and then you know the. the the, the person doesn't have the time to look at it, therefore doesn't have the time to fine tune and stuff like that. And suddenly he becomes overwhelmed with data coming out of it. And you know, a, a lot of times people just don't either, either don't look at the alarms or, or don't have the time to action it, or you know, or don't. Oh, I've not been on that training course. I don't understand how to log into that, or that's someone else's job. So having all these different these types of technologies are great to have, but if they're not you know, centralised, you don't have any uh, mechanism of bringing them all into one place. Then you know it's going to make that that one person. You know, typically you know, everyone's um, uh, time constraint in terms of uh, people's budgets. Um, it's not a very effective way to do it. And then when you have introduced inefficiency, that's where you introduce uh, breaches into your environment. Another one is having that data in different silos. So in, again, in different formats with different data retentions and different ways of accessing it. Um, so if, if you need to investigate something, you need to open up you know, Active Directory, look through the logs there, and then you need to look at the file logs, and then you need to you know, get a spreadsheet and put them all into... Uh, it's not very effective to have them all in different places. And then that fragmented workflow. So you know, we, I've done uh, talks about uh, building socks on limited resources. Um, Workflows is an easy thing to, to sort out. Okay, uh, having some a couple of real straightforward uh, steps and procedures uh, that you can give to, to give to your analyst that can drive them in the right direction. So you know, if someone's out of hours, what do they do? If it's in hours, what happens on the shift change? Having some kind of workflow and some kind of tool to, to centralize that workflow is again a barrier to um, more in the, the response side of things and the lack of automation. So there was a study done by, I think it was Juniper Networks uh, that I read earlier in the year, where the, the cost of an impact where automation had been deployed versus where it wasn't was about the difference was about $2 million worth. Okay? So where you can automate the simple tasks, you're, un you're not necessarily replacing the, the human element of it, you're just unburdening them from the, 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 the routine, mundane tasks that has taken up all of their, their time and effort, so therefore you can focus them on to tasks that require that kind of high level of intellect and if you, if you can automate that, that, that churn, it's going to make their lives a lot easier. So what we talk about is this concept of threat lifecycle management. Okay, so addressing these obstacles to enable faster detection and response. So, so, so TLM, threat lifecycle management, is, um, is using technology to align people and processes to uh, you know, increase the visibility across the whole of the IT estate um, and then the end point is to enable you to quickly mitigate and respond to threats as, uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and like I say, drive down those two metrics of mean time to detect and mean time to respond whilst keeping uh, staffing levels flat. So you know, no organisation I walk into, or very, very few organisations I walk into have the, the ability to hire more people to look at this. They have to work with what they've got. Okay? So if we can use some kind of uh, threat lifecycle management uh, to, to improve efficiency and, and remove those barriers we previously talked about, hopefully we can then start to address those time to detect and time to respond metrics. So what is it that we talk about uh, you know, uh, TLM? So we've got our two metrics on the top there, time to detect and time to respond. So the first thing is doing the data collection. So it's taking in that security event data that's probably already been generated in your environments at the moment. Okay. Um, taking that log data, taking that machine data, but also you deploying potentially new uh, sensors to actually fill in the blanks. So you know you might bring in you know AD logs, you know so on and so forth. But if you don't have maybe something at the network layer to do network analytics, then maybe you're missing that part of the conversation. Okay, so grabbing what you've already got and then filling in the blanks is is the key part there in, in, on your road to driving down that time to detect metric. So we've got all this big data. Now we need to be able to actually do something with it. So we need some kind of mechanism to practically discover threats in the environment. So we can use a combination of search analytics, uh, but also machine learning, machine analytics, uh, a little bit of AI, to basically go off and trawl through that data set and look for things and point out things you should be looking at further. 
once that comes up to you, being able to qualify that in or out, do I need to do a further investigation into that? The, the, the quicker you can get through that loop, you know, again, just unburdening that, that analyst to go and work on other tasks. So uh, assessing the threat, assessing the risk, and does it require a full investigation? And if it does, giving the, the, the analyst the, the, the tools to be able to analyze it, who, where, what, when, how do they get in, what have they touched, what is the extent of the nature uh, of the incident, and when we're now being driven by you know, um, uh, external regulations uh, like, like GDPR where you have to report a breach, you know, what you want to be able to do is when you do report those, those, those incidents to uh, you know, the ICL or whoever your governing body is, you say, yeah, okay, yeah, someone clicked on the link that they shouldn't have done, but we detected it within you know, three hours and we had it responded to within you know, five minutes. And in that period of time, these are the systems that it touched, these are the data sets it accessed, um, and therefore we know the, the, the extent of that breach. But then also being able to neutralize that as quickly as possible. So by implementing automated countermeasures, okay, so whether that's updating your file to block that IP address, whether it's killing processes, whether it's quarantining machines, disabling ADA accounts, you know, uh, forcing re-authentication, forcing password resets. Having these tools either completely automated with no human interaction or uh, as part of an approval process where you can quickly work through it and go, yeah, I need to apply that, that countermeasure very quickly from one location is going to help drive down that time to respond. So therefore, we can mitigate the threat and the associated risk that goes alongside it. And then the recovery phase. So this is not something that we're actively working on at Logarithm, but if you've worked through these steps you know, in, a, in a logical manner, you know, you know who, what, where, how, what data was touched, you know, you know everything about it because you've gone through a series of aligned steps. So therefore, your cleanup, your reporting, your review is, you know, is a lot easier, a lot more efficient because you've already gone through a good level of due diligence beforehand. And then crucially, the last part there, adapt. When I talked about the AVA industry, that's the thing that they do very, very, very well, is that they adapt to something that, that happened. Okay, so they'll go in and re, you know, refine the processes, they'll refine uh, what data they're collecting, they'll refine how they work, they, you know, how, you know, could they do things better? And if they can, then they actually implement them. So we tried to take all of those, those steps and put it into a single platform. So you know, as, as Logarithm, as a, as a security vendor, uh, this is all we do. We don't sell any other sort of technology areas. We're pure, purely a security um, uh, platform. We've been doing it for the last 15 years. Um, and, and so we try to bring as much of this capability into our platform so you don't have to work in those different technologies and we have it all on one, uh, you know, one platform, one product, one screen. So to enable this, um, th this faster detection response at Logarithm, you know, we have this, this data quality thing. So again, it's a very common strand that you should, you know, when you're talking to these big data vendors, getting data in is easy, being able to search and do something with it is hard. Okay, so at Logarithm we have a, a, a concept called the Machine Data Intelligence Fabric, or MDI Fabric. Okay, so we have a dedicated labs team and this is all they do. Okay, so we support out of the box, you know, thousands of device types where you can basically fire the, those logs into Logarithm and it's basically going to pull all this pertinent piece of information out of it. So this was the user, that was the IP address, that was the host, that was the, you know, so on and so forth. We'll then enrich that, so we'll say that IP address is actually in that country. It was an outbound network connection relating to this user. Um, but then we also apply classification to it. So that's basically telling you what it means. So that message there, you know, event ID 3421, that's an authentication failure. That's an authentication success. That one's a file deny. That one's whatever else it might be. So we basically apply that, um, this MDI to everything that comes in. And the upshot is we tell you what it, the, the, that log means or that set of logs means. So a rogue admin logging in from Norway, accessing payroll files, you know, for example. So we have a team of, you know, um, I think it's about 20 or 30 people in this team, and this is all they do. Okay, they're just really uh, writing these sorts of uh, these rules to, to cover that. And then from a global perspective, you know, we have a, a time normalization algorithm. So if you're receiving logs in different time zones, in different time formats, we have an algorithm that actually normalizes that. So if you're looking for event A followed by event B followed by event C, all happening within three hours, our, our um, time normalization algorithm will help that out. Precision search. So like I said, we've normalized the data. So now we give the ability to, to search that from a structure perspective. So you know, tell me where you know, Lee failed to log in. But also an unstructured search. So show me all the data where you know, this particular keyword, pattern, phrase 
exist in the, in the data lake, but then also crucially the machine assisted search. So having uh, some kind of automation, some kind of machine build those search queries for me so that I don't have to go out and, and kind of work it out. Something tells me this is what you need to be looking at and here's the data that results back from that search. And then applying that to a, some holistic threat detection. So there's another strand of the labs team um, and they basically write threat detection modules. So they take that, um, that content that the MDI is providing us and map that through to uh, usable threats, network threats, uh, endpoint threats, compliance regimes, uh, and so on and so forth. So the idea is that we, we're providing you the benefits of uh, advanced attack detection in real time to reduce the false negatives and the false positives. Risk-based monitoring. So uh, as I said, if you're getting uh, overwhelmed by alarms, uh, having some kind of risk-based uh, approach to what do I need to look at first, okay? So logarithm has that. So you can see that on the, on the right-hand side there, if three alarms come in, one has a risk score of 97 and one has one of 56, the one at 97 is what you need to be addressing first because that's what's going to have the biggest impact in your environment. Okay, and there's a number of different um, metrics that the algorithm takes to assign that risk score. So you know, if it's on a system relating to uh, where I hold all my intellectual property, then that's going to increase the risk score. If it's on my guest Wi-Fi, maybe that will reduce the risk score. So being able to you know, tell the analyst what you need to focus on as a priority is going to, again, unburden them from, from looking at every single alarm. And, and the final section is um, embedding what we call security automation and orchestration. So when I've talked to customers in the last six months, this is the thing that excites them the most. So you know, having a, a case management platform. So you know, everyone probably has a ticketing management system for you know, incident response, uh, so for, like, for IT incidents. So you know, my laptop's broke, I'll raise a ticket, someone deals with it. From an incident response uh, perspective, it's slightly different. You need to be a place to, to, to collaborate on data, um, collect it in, into one location, uh, have, you know, assign different uh, roles, assign in playbooks. So I can then say, right, well, this is a malware outbreak. The first step in this is to update the AV signatures across the board. The second step is to uh, quarantine the host. The third step is to do whatever it else is. And I'm going to assign the relevant task to someone, um, and they have to be done within a certain time frame. So you need to quarantine that host within 20 minutes after detecting this. Okay? If it goes over that, we'll alert someone and get them to... to um, you know, to practically go and actually work on it. So having some kind of uh, workflow streamlined, all working on one, on one, uh, one platform, is going to make that a lot easier. And then we've got a, 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 a part of our platform called Smart Response. So this is basically an open framework, and we have a number of these out of the box, but you know, our customers create them as well, where we can basically integrate with those, um, those investments in technology you've already made. So you know, you've got a firewall vendor, brilliant, yep, well, we can update the firewall block list. You've got... Uh, an endpoint detection response vendor, or we can tell him to go and quarantine the machine. We can you know, query against virus total. We can provide, you know, th this, this is ever growing, where we can basically automate these actions that are normally you, manually you'd have to do. Okay? The benefit is we're centralizing that investigation, providing faster response, and then being able to automate and respond to that as quickly as possible. So, so in summary, why, why is Logarithm the, uh, should be your strategic uh, TLM partner? In terms of focus, this is all we do. Okay, we don't do anything else. We don't have any other products. We don't have any other technology areas. Uh, our level, and because of that, our level of innovation is increased is very, very fast. We're bringing out uh, new um, features, new parts of our platform very, very frequently. And you know, for the most part, we don't like uh, a charge or, or license these out. Uh, you know, they're pretty much part of the core platform. From scalability and flexibility, with, we, we allow you to grow or, or flex and scale with, with your deployment. So you might start out with you know, a small subset of data you want to collect, but over time you have aspirations to grow, the logarithm platform easily scales and grows with you. Um, for reference, we've got a, set, a, a white paper that's been ratified by SANS where we're ingesting about 26 billion log data uh, events a day, uh, but you can still search 24 hours worth of that data and get a result in about 30 seconds. So we can scale to very, very large, but also, you know, we've got very, very small companies that are using us as well. That labs team writes uh, compliance modules, so you know, things around, you know, ISO 27001, PCI, GDPR, NIST, whatever else you're looking to address, our compliance team have basically mapped that MDI data into the compliance mandates, and then you can then tally the two up. And the final one is, is customer success. So 
You know, we are passionate about making sure that every single one of our customers is success, successful with our platform, and we you know we're actively involved in making sure they are reducing those those two metrics we talked about: the time to detect and time to respond. So, um, so with that, that's that's me. That's my presentation. Uh, if anyone's got any questions later on, we, we, we you know, we've got a stand in the exhibitor hall. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>